Family history has it that my paternal grandfather, Arthur, was the first man in his home city of York, England, to own a motorised taxi. This would be sometime around the early years of World War I. Now, the switch from horse and buggy to a, a new fangled motor car was an exciting and potentially profitable move for Arthur. He'd built up his business. Things were going well. But then, as the war dragged on and the fighting intensified, Arthur was called up to the army. And he found himself serving in the Royal Artillery somewhere on the Western Front. His life, his hopes and dreams, his plans and prospects were shattered forever when he became a victim of a German gas attack. His lungs wrecked, Arthur returned to civilian life as a semi-invalid. He never drove a taxi again and he struggled to survive and to support his family on whatever meagre government benefits he could claim. My grandmother Martha, she suffered too. Her nerves were shot to pieces as Arthur struggled to breathe and she struggled to make ends meet in rented rooms with a growing family to take care of. She died a few years after Arthur had passed away at um, what seems now to be a young age. Then in 1939, another war erupted. A war whose lineage, I think, can be traced directly to that first conflagration. My father, Geoffrey, who had left school at the age of 14, with no skills and few prospects, was called up and he found himself serving in what was then known as the Far East with the uh, British 14th Army. And it was known uh, among its troops as the Forgotten Army because it seemed to its soldiers that no one back in England cared about what was going on in the jungles and exotically named places such as Imphal, Kohima, Maiktila, Mandalay and Rangoon. Chiffrey wasn't physically wounded, but he contracted several tropical diseases while serving in the jungles, and he forever suffered the after-effects of malaria. And as for his mind, I don't think he ever really recovered from the trauma. He had a ferocious temper, followed by fits of depression, and he drank every night four pints of bitter, usually, every evening. I've often asked myself, would he have been like this if not for Arthur's experience in that war? Would he have been like that if the Great War had never been? Of course, these are impossible questions without an answer. I'll never know. But again, would my mother have been any different were it not for that war? Because her family had very little money as a result of the Great Depression, which uh, quickly followed the war. And she left school, Mari, at the age of 11 to go into service in some kind of posh upstairs, downstairs manner, where she polished the silver and beat the carpets. She had no prospects and no ambitions. I don't think she even knew what they were. During World War II, uh, she worked as a cleaner in a military hospital. And she actually witnessed the uh, the bombing of Sheffield as well uh, by the Nazis. I think it was in forty two. It came for the steelworks then. After the war, Mari spent the rest of her working life cleaning for the wealthy. There were no feasible opportunities for further education for either her or my father Jeff. The Great War's impact ripples out in subtle ways today, more than a hundred years after the event. It's there, residing individuals, families and communities whose potential may have been shattered, and conversely, in, in, in those who might have prospered. There's nothing we could do about it. There's no point in complaining about it. But it's interesting, I think, to try to identify turning points and their consequences for, for good or ill. History 
is replete with what ifs. What if Franz Ferdinand hadn't taken a wrong turn in the streets of Sarajevo? What if Alfred von Schlieffen and his successor von Moltke had thought, you know what, violating Belgian neutrality is going to cause more trouble than it's worth? Or that British commanders had judged the Somme a lousy place for a big battle? Or even that Arthur's artillery company had been diverted somewhere else on the morning of that fateful gas attack. Who knows? No one. When it comes to history, we know what happens next. But the people of history had no idea. And even when they prepared in meticulous detail the law of unintended consequences would often have the last laugh. Perhaps unwittingly, the people of the present, us and future us, may read back their own morals, prejudices and knowledge into bygone behaviours, as if history's people are just us in fancy dress and must be judged with fearless harshness if we don't like how they behave, or the decisions that they made. Now, of course, it is legitimate to make judgments, but they are only meaningful if kept within the context of the times. Projecting back modern mores makes for bad history. And now, there is no shortage of opinion and criticism when it comes to the 20th century's two mega wars. The outstanding scholar of World War I, uh, Professor Margaret Macmillan, says it's estimated that to date some 32,000 books in English have been published just on the origins of World War I. Just the origins. That's 32,000 opinions, angles, agendas, viewpoints. Our views of World War I have been shaped by these books but they've also been shaped by poets such as um, Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, and Edmund Blunden. Then there's no end of opinion-shaping fiction such as uh, Oh, What a Lovely War, Birdsong, Parade's End, and, let's say, All Quiet on the Western Front. And we must not forget the 1989 television show Blackadder Goes Forth, featuring the characters of Blackadder, Baldrick, General Melchett, and Lieutenant George St. Barley, and their adventures in the trenches. It's funny, it's brilliantly acted, well-directed and scripted, but what it isn't is history. And... For the politician and author Alan Clark, writing, writing in 1961, he described the British Army of the Great War as consisting of lions led by donkeys. It's easy to make such judgments, but they ignore what the um, German historians Sonke Neitzel and Harold Felser refer to as frames of reference, that is, the way reality is experienced and understood by history's people, history's actors. They write, when we want to explain human behaviour, we first must reconstruct the frame of reference in which given human beings operated, including which factors structured their perception and suggested certain conclusions. When Frames of reference are ignored, they say. Present day standards are enlisted to allow us to understand what was going on. It's only in retrospect that historical developments appear inevitable and compulsory. They say this. While they are still developing, social processes contain a rich variety of possibilities of which only a handful are actually taken up, and they in turn create certain path dependencies and a dynamic of their own. 
Now I'll give a reference to that book and, and others quoted here uh, in the reference place below. My early views of World War I were shaped by the author Captain W.E. Johns's hero pilot Biggles. Might be familiar to people of uh, my generation in England and Australia. Uh, Biggles flew a, a sop with camel and they had a trusty sidekicks in uh, algae and ginger. It was all brilliant. Uh, I was 10 when I read this, thought it was fabulous. Uh, it was a, a ripping yarn. But then, at the age of 16, I read uh, Wilfred Owen and other World War I poets for my school exams. I had never encountered more beautiful and moving poems than those such as Strange Meeting and Dolce Decorum Est. They remain magnificent and moving poems. Here's um, a few lines from Dolce Est. It's a gas attack and they've, uh, 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 one of the soldiers has been unable to get his gas mask on, his gas helmet on. He plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If, in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, Obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some eager glory. The old lie, Dalcea decorum est, pro patri mori. That last um, Latin line is from the Roman poet Horace, and it means it is sweet and noble to die for one's country, and probably a phrase um, only uttered with irony after, <laughs> after uh, Owen's poem. Perceptions change with time and new knowledge. The Great War wasn't sparked by one thing, such as an assassination or European imperial rivalry, but rather by a merging of forces such as uh, industrialism, nationalism, new developments in weaponry, and the weaknesses inherent in 19th century diplomacy. And during the 19th and early 20th centuries, the ongoing industrial revolutions saw railway and telegraph networks booming across Europe, the new internal combustion engine was developed, petroleum, and there were new alloys and new chemicals that changed everything. But at the same time, it was a world of duty, pageantry, patriotism, nationalism, militarism, imperialism, and very rigid class distinctions. But these all were slowly being undermined, slowly, by the advances of Marxism and socialism. It was a peculiar mix of modernity and demode. It was a recipe for disaster. According to uh, Professor Gary Sheffield, the Great War represented a clash of 20th century technology with 19th century military science. Bolt-action rifles, rapid-firing machine guns, smokeless powder, powerful rifled artillery with hydraulic recoil mechanisms and high-explosive shells came into being. But they existed, for example, inside a British army, which by 1917 still had more than one million horses and mules in service. Over the course of the war, says Sheffield, Britain lost 484,000 horses. One horse for every two men. They also had lots of dogs, uh, uh, actually. Um, 
I'll tell that story another time about the dogs, because it's interesting what um, dogs will do for people, but also what people will do for dogs. It's a, it's a good story. I'll come back to that in another episode. At the war's outbreak, the massed ranks of cavalry marshalled on all sides symbolised the cruel evolution of warfare. They looked impressive. They were horribly vulnerable. British proponents of cavalry had pointed to the brilliant performance of the mounted Boer sharpshooters in the recent South African War, maintaining that the shock action of cavalry was still the essential tactical counterpart to, to infantry power, according to um, Field Marshal Viscount Montgomery in his, in his A History of Warfare. But he said, however, that by 1914, mounted troops had outlived their usefulness in battle. The South African campaign had given the British a foretaste of what was to come. At the Battle of Spion Corp in January 1900, a well dug in Boer unit armed with German made bolt action magazine fed Mauser rifles inflicted grievous casualties on a British force almost devoid of cover. Montgomery noted that this had been called the supreme day in the history of the rifle. Having learnt a painful lesson, the British produced their own model of deadly rifle fire with the new, then new, boat action Lee Enfield. It sustained um, 15 rounds rapid or mad minute from each soldier, made such an impression on the Germans at the Marne in 1914 that many thought they were being fired on by multiple machine guns. Now, most of the war's generals were not stupid. They had some inkling of what might lie ahead. Many of them had read of von Clausewitz, who had declared, everything in war is very simple, but the simplest thing is difficult. The difficulties accumulate and end by producing a kind of friction that is inconceivable unless one has experienced war. There had been warnings that the next war would be far worse than any before. Writing in um, 1898, the Russian economist uh, Ivan Bloch declared that the invention of smokeless powder and quick-firing rifles had effected as great a revolution in contemporary warfare as the introduction of printing with movable type accomplished in the calligraphic and illuminating arts of the Middle Ages. But he said these innovations only excited curiosity without arousing misgivings as to their ultimate consequences. He said, great is the conservatism of staff officers and childlike the trust of rank and file in the thaumaturgic power of the past over the present and future, he said. The war began to go wrong in the first couple of months. The Germans, following the Schlieffen plan, which had been fiddled with by Molka, his successor, in an attempt to provide for co various contingencies, began the invasion of Belgium at 8.02 a.m. on August 4th, 1914, with the same commitment to Bewegungskrieg, which meant war of manoeuvre, which the Germans were to implement again in the early years of World War II, when it was named, uh, misnamed, Blitzkrieg, which is a name invented by the press. Britain quickly declared war on Germany. Germans could not get over the perfidy of it, wrote the author Barbara Tuckman. It was unbelievable that the English, having degenerated to the stage where suffragettes heckled the Prime Minister and defied the police, were going to fight. But the British had guaranteed they would defend the neutrality of Belgium. When Germany refused to withdraw, Britain, with its then small colonial army, colonial army went off to war. In elegiac tones, Britain's Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey, lamented, The lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. 
The lamps were also going out on Motka's advance, which had been thwarted by the Allies at the Battle of the Marne and later at the Aisne and Ypres. It was the closest the Germans got to winning the war. However, they were able to regroup and dig in at Flanders in Belgium and northern France, and in so doing, emphasised in the words of the military historian Basil Little Hart, the preponderant power of defence over attack. And so was born the ghastly nightmare of trench warfare, with its mud, blood, machine guns, gas, barbed wire and massed artillery and the relentless murderous slaughter of the over-the-top of the trenches and military advances. The so-called donkeys, Haig and his generals and their allied equivalents were facing something new. In the words of Professor John Bond, there wasn't a script to follow. This historian says, what they were doing was unique. No one had been asked to do it before or again. It was, says Boyne, like learning to drive by having a series of road crashes. And as World War, as, sorry, as Professor David Reynolds puts it, World War I did not follow a heroic narrative such as that attributed to World War II. It appeared to be a subject either for tragedy or for satire. Now, there was tragedy aplenty as Allied commanders and troops struggled to overcome any position, enemy positions, which for a large part were slightly uphill and atop the chalk substrata. And this meant that the Germans could construct bunkers and shelters deep down in the chalk that were immensely difficult to breach. Everything Allied commanders had learned about strategy, operations and tactics suddenly became redundant in an unprecedented horoscope of blood and mud in which defence dominated the offensive and the enemy, the Germans, the German army, was a hard, clever and courageous foe. For much of the first three years it was a grim war of attrition. Breakthroughs were planned but they mostly ended in Mass casualties for little territorial gain. The Flanders battlefields were replete with towns, villages, rivers and woods whose name, names simultaneously ring dark now, but sweet then. Passchendaele, Ypres, Messines, beaumont Hamel, Neuve-Chapelle, Mametz, and the Somme. It was at this last that the epic tragedy was played out from July the 1st to November the 18th, 1916. It was not General Douglas Haig's choice to fight at the Somme. French General Joseph Joffre had demanded the British attack there in order to take the pressure off the French troops under siege at Verdun. The intention was to break the German front between Bapaum and Ginchy, push back the German flank to Arras and then launch a general advance to Cambrai and Douai. And so the July 1 British infantry assault had been preceded by a colossal artillery barrage lasting four days involving 445 guns ranging from trench mortars to massive 15-inch howitzers. In all, they fired around 1.5 million rounds. If you were Douglas Haig, you'd probably think, that'll do it. Little Hart records that Haig had suggested tentatively that before the massive infantry were launched, the result of the bombardment and the state of the defences might be tested by sending ahead patrols of small parties, but this suggestion was rejected by his army commanders. And so when the infantry emerged from the trenches, many were mown down before they could fire a shot, leading to 
57,470 casualties, including 19,240 killed. Historian John Keegan declared that the battle was the greatest tragedy of Britain's national military history and marked the end of an age of vital optimism in British life that has never been recovered. Nevertheless, the seeds of a revolution in military affairs were sown in the later phases of the Somme offensive, uh, which uh, began on September the 15th. The attack, so 36 of them, made its debut. They were to have a much bigger impact in November 1917 when 381 of these beasts were unleashed to great effect at Cambrai. The next year, in March 1918, following the collapse of Russia and Romania, Ludendorff, the German commander, launched a massive offensive pushing through a 47-mile front astride the Somme Valley from Arras to the Fair, forcing Goff's army to retreat. But then in May, Ludendorff's offensive bumped into something new. An American army, led by General John Pershing. It was a sign of things to come, not just in this war, but also World War II. Led by numerous tanks, French, British and American soldiers attacked the northeast flank of the Marne salient. And to add to the new look war-making, Allied aircraft joined the attack at the Battle of Amiens. Further battles took place, including at Argonne, where thousands of troops from the American First Army proved their combat worth. The Germans were at last broken, and hostilities ceased at 11am on November the 11th, 1918. The war, to end all wars, was over at a cost of millions of dead and wounded. Douglas Haig was on the winning side. He had been a senior commander from the very beginning when the small British army had landed in France in 1914. As well as the Somme, he was also a commander of battles including Arras, 3rd Ypres, Passchendaele and the final 100 days offensive. I personally don't think there is any doubt about his courage, his fortitude, his ability to bounce back after failure, and also his you know, regular competence as a staff officer, albeit a somewhat rigid and unimaginative one. When Haig died in 1928, more than, more, than, sorry, more than one million people lined the streets of London for the funeral procession. More than that for Princess Diana many years later. It is clear that many regarded him as a hero worthy of respect and remembrance. Unless, as a, a cynical wag put it, they were just checking to make sure that he was really dead. World War I was unlike any war before it in its scale, complexity, constantly developing technology, automatic weapons, aircraft, tanks, the impacts of weather conditions and unprecedented large and well-equipped armies. The top brass did not come out of it looking good. Sir Bernard Montgomery, who served as a junior officer in World War I and was also seriously wounded, had some festering concerns about the quality of the senior staff. A remarkable and disgraceful fact is that a high proportion of the most senior officers were ignorant of the conditions in which the soldiers were fighting, he wrote. The quality of the men who had to do the fighting contrasts with the quality of the generals, he added in A History of Warfare, his book. Montgomery himself was a thoughtful and cautious general, uh, no doubt a legacy of uh, what happened in the Great War. Now, there were some World War I elements in his most famous successful battle at uh, El Alamein in North Africa in 1942. Opening as it did with a prolonged artillery barrage and an infantry walk through no man's land, uh, which was riddled with German mines. As an aside, my uncle Bruce uh, served under Monty as a frontline infantry soldier in Europe from landing in Normandy at Sword Beach to uh, War's End with the, the 21st Army Group in 1945. He had nothing but praise for Monty 
uh, and he said that other soldiers did too. They regarded him uh, as a person who genuinely cared about them. Interestingly, though my uncle was in the thick of the fighting, he never sustained any injury whatsoever. Just sheer luck, he would say. The psalm is renowned for the enormous number of killed and wounded, but it is well overshadowed by the battle for, say, Stalingrad, which involved several operations fought between August 1942 to February 1943. Depending on the sources you go by, total casualties for the Soviets were 1,129,619, including more than 478,000 killed or missing. Do you think anyone called Zhukov, Timoshenko and Rokozovsky at all? A donkey? I seriously doubt it. Most of the field marshals and generals in World War I were out of their depth because they were not prepared for the conflict that unfolded. They either had to adapt or die, either literally or metaphorically, and what seems blindingly obvious to us was opaque to them because we live history backwards and they lived it forwards. We know what happens. They didn't until it did. What were they fighting for? Many reasons, but I think many would echo the words of Faramir to Frodo in The Lord of the Rings, in The Two Towers, written by J.R. Tolkien himself, a combat uh, veteran of uh, World War I. This is what the words Tolkien puts into Faramir's mouth. I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend. Thank you.